Hey guys, it's Michelle with Florida Keys Birding and today we're talking about a very special bird. We're talking about the American Robin. So this is a very early migrant. That's why we're talking about this bird today. You might be seeing this bird start to show up back in your area already. You may have already seen this bird or you might be seeing them very, very soon. So let's talk a little bit about migration, identification, what they eat and so on. And we'll go into a little bit of detail about the migration patterns. So um, to ID this bird, it's gonna be a large songbird with a round body, long legs and fairly long tail. I don't think anybody can not recognize the robin. It's pretty common, but you never know if you're a new birder or if you haven't seen one before, um, you might still need some help with it. So um, to identify their plumage, they have a gray brown color on their back, even though to me it looks like it's black, but apparently it's more of like a gray brown. And they have a warm, bright orange underpart and they have a dark head and they also have that little white eye ring it's like a split eye ring kind of sorta I don't know if that's how you would um, describe it but that's something I always notice kind of interesting on the American Robin so um, in flight they also have a white eye patch on the lower belly and under the tail that can be kind of conspicuous to see and compared with females uh, I'm sorry compared with males Females have paler heads with contrast less with their gray back. So um, Western populations are also often a little bit paler than the Eastern populations and have almost no white at the tail corners. And breeding robins on the Canadian Atlantic coast are richly colored with black on the upper back and neck. They can sometimes be confused with the very thrush or the Eastern and spotted towhee. I've seen the Eastern Toei and we have those in the Everglades and I mean the coloring is a little bit similar but I think the Robin's pretty common. I don't think it's too hard to get confused. So let's talk a little bit about migration. So really exciting, this year um, the Robin, the American Robin was seen in the Keys and in Miami this year. So some say that this is due to lack of food sources a little bit farther north because um, it is not common to see an American Robin in South Florida. I know most people do see them and most people do get them you know throughout the year you know throughout the United States and so on all over the place but we do not get to see them every year normally I do get to see one every February usually when I go to Orlando or Gainesville or Northern Florida Georgia stuff like that we do get to see one um, but I haven't gotten to to see one this year unfortunately I was hoping to get one in my yard um, but I haven't been that lucky quite yet so they do leave as early as February and although robins are considered the announcer of spring many robins spend the whole winter in their breeding range um, because you know that and most of the time people don't realize it it's because they spend more time roosting in trees and less time in your yard looking for worms and stuff like that so you're much less likely to see them um, and the number of robins present in northern parts of the range varies each year with local conditions so you know it depends on what's going on in the environment so how can the robin survive in the cold winter months because I mean you know a lot of places up north are getting constant snow and it's really really cold and maybe there's not a ton of food or something like that so um, so actually the down feathers will trap air and they're an excellent insulator for the robin so the puffed out feathers will insulate the birds internal organs so that they stay at least 104 degrees Wow that's pretty crazy if you think about it um, and the outside of the feather is cold just like the air but just a few millimeters under the feathers the bird's body temperature is a cozy 104 degrees it's nice and warm so the robin has actually been able to survive blinding blizzards ice storms and nights as cold as 30 degrees below zero without any assistance from humans that's pretty crazy <laughs> 
So regardless of how cold it is on the outside of the feathers, the body temperature again will stay that 104 degrees. So I think that's pretty interesting. I think that's pretty exciting. And I think things like this are proof that we do have a special creator of all of our wildlife and how things, how, how they were made and uh, to adapt to um, their environments like that and, and to be able to, to do that. I think it's pretty awesome and amazing. And I think it does point to a creator with a purpose. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, so you know, what is their root? Um, the root thing doesn't really apply for robins because um, they don't have like a strong evidence to show that there's a connection between overwintering and breeding grounds in specific areas, you know, coming back to certain places and so on, like some other birds. It's just kind of random. They're just kind of scattered all over the place. And um, and like I said, they do stay a lot in a certain, certain places that they'll stay year round. So um, let's take a minute now and let's talk a little bit more detail about migration and let's look at some maps. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about robin migration. Um, as you can see here, this is um, on eBird. If you go to science.ebird.org, you can look at this map. And we're going to look a little bit at the migration, the weekly, you know, migration throughout the year, um, the abundance, the trends, and the range. So let's start with abundance. This is showing that the in the non-breeding season, you can find them mostly down here in the southern states and in Florida, um, southern Louisiana, southern Georgia, Texas, and into Mexico, and even New Mexico or Arizona and stuff like that. And then you can see year-round they can be found in most of the country. And then it says also that you can find them in the breeding season way, way, way far north into Canada. So you can kind of see their general abundance. And then the range is going to show, you know, something similar, almost exactly the same. So, okay, so trends. And you can see kind of where they're concentrated the most. You can see some here uh, in the southern states it looks like nebraska san francisco virginia north carolina so you can kind of see the concentration so let's look at the weekly migration let's start in june because i believe that was the time yes all right yep be the beginning of june so this is about june 14th so you can see that most of them are up in the northern states and they're up in canada and they're doing their breeding thing through the summer and as you can see through june into july into august but they're already starting to move a little bit farther south out of canada a little bit more heavy into the northern united states and into august let's watch these changes they're starting to really come down out of canada they're starting to migrate and they're going into the u.s okay into september you still have some up there in canada and as we go a little farther into migration september into october you can kind of see um, it's being a lot more heavily concentrated farther south. You can see them really starting to make their way south completely out of Canada by um, an end of October, mid to early November. They're almost completely out of Canada. Okay, and by November 9th, they're, they're pretty much out of Canada, and they're into their wintering, they're just about into their wintering ground, still heading a little bit farther south, mid-November, later November, into December, and it looks like they've finally kind of, kind of concentrated and reached where they're going to be for the winter. So let's keep looking, now we're into late December, early January. They're really concentrated in the southern part of the U.S. to central Midwest and then over here in the northern part of um, California and into Oregon and Washington. So, and then you've got some down here in Mexico, but I think 
I think these are a population that kind of stay where they're at. So, all right, so as you can see into January, February, they're already, you see a little bit, watch, watch this up here as it changes. You can see a little bit of movement getting more concentrated in the northern parts of the state. And then March, yep, they're really getting on the move. So they don't waste any time. They're kind of an earlier migrant. You're going to see them on the move February into early March. Mid-March, they're leaving Florida. By March 22nd, they're really, really um, getting out of Florida pretty quickly. Versus warblers, where they take almost until mid-May to really leave Florida. So this is, this is really an early, more early migrant. And as you can see into April, March to April, they're pretty much gone out of Florida. They're already up getting into Canada. They're not wasting any time <laughs> getting into their breeding areas. And look at that, even by April 26th, they're already back up to where they would be. So they're probably already starting their breeding pretty early. So, and then into May, I mean, they're, they're way, way up there. And into June, boom, they're way, way, way northern Canada. And even into Alaska. Look at that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, how to attract these birds to your yard. So, you're going to want to put out things at the feeder like sunflower seeds, mealworms, peanut hearts, fruit um, or suet. These are the kind of things that they like and they do prefer a platform feeder or a ground feeder or just, you know, stuff on the ground. They'll just go ahead and take it because <laughs> um, you've seen these guys. They're like running all over your yard. They're pecking at insects, you know, stuff like that. That's kind of their style. That's what they do. Um, and they do like large grassy patches to look for bugs. So the typical, you know, front yard, backyard, whatever. They also like fruiting trees. So if you have some fruiting trees planted, um, like maybe a mulberry tree or different types of trees that produce berries, um, like the strangler fig or the gumbo limbo down here, that is if we had robins right now, <laughs> you know, um, we don't have any right now, but um, I wish we did. I hope we do but I don't know, I doubt it at this point because they're already probably making their way back north. Um, but you know, here's hoping. Anyway, but um, they do like to eat a varied diet. So robins will eat different kinds of foods depending on the time of day. In the morning, they'll eat more earthworms and uh, they'll eat more fruit later in the day. So that's kind of interesting. And because robins forage largely on lawns, they are vulnerable to pesticides and poisoning. So don't put those chemicals on your lawn and don't let your bug guys spray around your lawn. Just tell them to spray around the perimeter of your house and no lawn pesticides. So you gotta keep, get rid of all of that. That's not good for us anyway. It's not good for the environment. It's not good for the birds. It's not good for anybody. So we don't want to do that. So don't, just don't do it. Okay. I don't do any pesticides. I don't do any pesticides on my lawn, only around my, my house, you know, for those disgusting palmetto bugs that we get um but yeah so um yeah and i don't have any problems with bugs eating my plants i don't have any issues there and i live in the bug capital of the world let me just tell you that <laughs> so um nature does its job if you just kind of leave it so um the the robins they do eat a lot of fruit in the fall and winter and something interesting is actually when they eat honeysuckle berries exclusively they will sometimes become intoxicated. I have never seen an intoxicated robin, but let me know if you have. That's got to be interesting. Tell me about it. Um, okay, so robins will also eat a large number of invertebrates and fruit, like I said, um, particularly in the spring and summer. They'll eat more, you know, insects and worms and snails, which makes sense because they're breeding. They need all that protein and stuff like that. Um, and they eat a quite a variety of fruits, um, including choke berries, berries, hawthorn, dogwood, sumac, and juniper berries. These are, that's no, not any plants that we have down here, but maybe if you're from up north, you know what these are. We do have dogwood. We have Jamaica dogwood. So I don't think they do berries or anything like that though. So um, one study suggested that robins may try to round out their diet by selectively eating fruits that have bugs in them. Hmm, smarty pants. 
<laughs> so um, the habitat, you know, you're going to find these generally all around. Lots of different habitats, golf courses, gardens, parks, yards, fields, pastures, tundra, deciduous woodlands, pine forests, shrublands, and forest regenerating after fires. So you're going to find them pretty much all over the place. Um, and during the winter, they might move to more moist woods <clears throat> where berry producing trees and shrubs are common. So the wintering grounds are also pretty similar, not a lot of big difference there. And a cool couple of cool facts about the robin is that they can produce three successful broods a year, which most birds, if you haven't noticed, only do one brood a year, maybe two, but they can do three. And on average, only 40% of the nests successfully produce young. So that's kind of sad. That kind of made me sad to read that. And then it said only 25% of those fledged young survive to November. That's also super sad. I kind of didn't want to put this fact in because it's kind of sad to hear that. But it said despite the fact that a lucky robin can, um, you know, despite all that, a lucky robin can live to 14 years old. Um, the oldest recorded robin was 13 years and 11 months. So they can live quite a long time if they make it through. So another cool fact is that their roosts can be super huge, including up to a quarter of a million birds roosting together during the winter. So in the summer, when they roost, the females will usually sleep at their nests while the males will gather at roosts. And young robins may become more independent uh, and then they'll join the males. So female adults will go to the roost only after they finish nesting. So that's pretty cool. Um, and then let's finish off with conservation. So, you know, like I said before, robins eat worms and bugs off lawns. So keep those pesticides off your lawn and garden. There's no reason to have them. So don't do it. Just don't do it. Let's protect all the birds and the wildlife from all of that nonsense. Um, so th there's natural ways to do it you know so um, also they're susceptible to car and window strikes just like most other birds are so be careful of that we did talk in the last video about some tips on window strikes what you can do to prevent it um, and then robins also don't seem to mind being close to human activity or high human traffic areas so they don't really um, you know they don't really seem to mind people around it's like some other birds that can be shy and it can really stress them out um, robins don't seem to be one of those birds um, they can do some damage to commercial fruit crops or your fruit gardens, fruit trees, and stuff like that. So that can be a problem to commercial fruit growers and stuff like that. Um, but you know, we love the robins, so we don't care. <laughs> and right now populations are stable, so that's another thing we don't really have to worry about. They're doing pretty well, so let's continue to support all our wildlife by taking care of the environment and taking care of the wildlife and um, keeping them safe, free from chemicals and terrible things like that. Keep your feeders clean and your um, watering stations clean and all that good stuff. And I hope you get to see a robin soon and you get some warm weather. Thanks.